Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and uh, welcome to our session. We have an afternoon filled with more insights uh, with some of the most influential minds uh, in our industry, both in this session and in the following sessions uh, through the end of the day. Uh, up next, we have the privilege of having very senior representatives from three of our regulators, both federal and provincial. And they will speak to us about the way they see the health of the systems that they oversee uh, as they oversee uh, different jurisdictions uh, in the country. Uh, let me introduce, can, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we're good, okay. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, to my immediate left is Jacqueline Friedland, who is the Executive Director of Risk Assessment and Intervention Hub at OSFI, uh, where she leads the supervision teams for all federally regulated financial institutions. Prior to joining OSFI, she was a Chief Risk Officer, Chief Compliance Officer, and Chief Actuary at RSA Canada. Welcome, Jacqueline. Blair Morrison is the Chief Executive Officer of BC Financial Services Authority, or BCFSA, and also the CEO of Credit Union Deposit Insurance Corporation, QDIC, where he has been serving in that role since 2019. And in that capacity, he's the superintendent for several regulated industries, uh, including financial services and, uh, and real estate. Welcome, Blair. And Jordan Solway is the Executive Vice President of Legal and Enforcement at Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, FISRA. He oversees legal services and regulatory enforcement in this capacity and is responsible for ensuring that FISRA's policies and regulatory framework is effective and is enforced to protect the public interest. So I will ask the panel some prepared questions. We're going to have a discussion. And when we have about 25 minutes or so left, uh, we will turn to you for your questions. So unlike the session in sessions in the morning, uh, we're gonna do this the old way, the way we used to do. Please put up your hand and somebody from our team will bring your microphone. And I am really looking forward to an engaged dialogue here. We have a full room and I'm sure you have lots of questions for our regulators <coughs> while we have them here. Uh, so I want to start maybe with some of the themes we covered this morning, but from your perspective, changing things a little bit. We hear a lot from all regulators about this notion of cultivating a risk-aware culture. And it is certainly not a new, new concept, but it has gained prominence in the last few years in our lexicon. And as we, share, as we also discussed this morning, um, financial sector is truly navigating through a very complex volatile, uh, different landscape today than we did a few years ago. There are lots of new risks or emerging risks that we're managing that the way we think about them is really different. Third party risk management comes to mind, uh, for example. So given that landscape, as you're looking at the organizations that you're regulating, what does it mean to you to be a strong risk culture, to have a strong risk culture in the organizations that you oversee? How does it come to life? And can you give us some examples, perhaps, of what you're intending to see as a regulator in a strong risk culture? So I will first go in this order that we see here. So Jacqueline, you will start with you, okay. then we'll continue from there. So I want to address this question really in two parts. First, the newly emerging risks, and second, the risk culture. And I don't want to start the, by sounding like a contrarian, but I will. As I thought about the question, I don't necessarily see the risks as newly emerging. And you know, first I think about the cyber risk training that I have to undergo that I did this year as part of Government of Canada. And I think about what I did five years ago at RSA, and I think about what I did 10 years ago when I was a partner at KPMG. And it's not that different. It's, you know, there was the phishing and there was the hacking and how to protect your screen and what to do if you're in a public place and when not to sign on to the public Wi-Fi. And you know, yes, the frequency is up and the severity is up and how quickly it impacts and shuts down system may be faster than before, but it's not that early emerging. And I'll give two more examples. In February 2014, so this is a decade, more than a decade ago, I led a research project for the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, the CIA, not that CIA, our Canadian CIA. <laughs> and the title was Water Damage Risk in the Canadian Property Insurance Pricing. And I'm going to quote, in the second sentence of the opening paragraph of this now decade-old paper, I wrote, in recent years, damage from water and other climate-related perils have emerged to replace fire and theft as the largest source of claim cost for Canada's property and casualty insurers. Systematic underpricing of water damage risk threatens insurance company profitability and capital 
and has the potential to lead to property insurance availability issues for both personal and commercial products. I searched this decade-old paper. It had 127 hits uh, of climate. It was only 60 pages. So concern about climate is not newly emerging in the impact. The final example is a paper I did in November of 2014, also for the CIA. I'm an actuary by background, <laughs> a very proud one. And I quote, this was on operational risks. Operational risk losses are high profile, uncertain, and headline grabbing. Despite the best endeavors of companies, material operational risk losses keep occurring. In the insurance sector, operational risk losses tend to be less dramatic than in the banking. They measured in the hundreds of millions rather than the billions of dollars, with losses crystallizing over a longer period. It's therefore appropriate from an economic perspective and mandatory from a regulatory perspective to hold capital against this risk. This paragraph could have been written last week without much difference. So all that said, to effectively address and thrive, given the myriad of risks and the significance of these risks, requires organizations with an effective risk culture. The body of your question. One of my favorite thought leadership resources is the IRM, the Institute of Risk Management. And they speak of risk culture as something that describes the values, the beliefs, the knowledge, attitudes, and understanding about risk shared by a group with a common purpose. Banks need a risk culture, insurers need a risk culture, regulators need a risk culture. At OSFI, it's our risk appetite statement that drives our risk culture. Just as we expect the risk appetite statements of all the institutions we regulate to drive theirs. Our risk appetite statement lays the foundation for our decision making. It helps determine and prioritize what we do. It supports our strategic and operational management and it helps our stakeholders know what we're doing and understanding. At OSFI, we speak of grit, urgency, and integrity, all of which reflect our risk culture. And when you ask about a practical way in which risk culture comes to life, one issue that comes to my mind is agility and efficiency over perfection in decision making. Comfort in acting with less than complete information while you set up the appropriate guardrails around decisions given that imperfection. It's acting without analysis paralysis, but acting in a sound way and recognizing that at times you feel like you're on a tightrope. Thank you, Jacqueline. Blair, what are your thoughts from your point of view and maybe BC um, taking so into I account? So I just want to say yes, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have uh, three things to start off with. First of all, thank you to the Global Risk Institute for doing this, and thank you for all coming here. Um, these kinds of dialogues are incredibly important. Um, we are clear that we don't have all the answers, but you don't have them either. And we need to have those conversations to find what's the best way forward. Second thing I'd like to say is there is an election in British Columbia. I am not the government. I am an independent crown agency. But there's this little thing called interregnum, which is the period between governments. So I'm not here to invoke huge policy statements. I'm not here to invite exciting, which is my standard process, exciting dialogue on you know new and interesting where BC is going. I, I will be consistent with what we've talked about, but I am a little bit um, constrained. The third thing I'm going to say is I'm retiring in 2025, so in about a couple of months, no one will want to hear anything I have to say. So <laughs> you can quickly wash that out. Um, we were talking a little bit about the uh, vice president debates, and I am a political junkie. Uh, I can't watch the debates because they make me <laughs> sick, but I, you know, I, I do watch, I do get the, uh, the 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 reviews later on. Every election cycle in uh, the United States, they bring up uh, something from Clinton's uh, election. Jim Carvel is this a strategist from Louisiana. I've heard him speak. Fascinating guy, and he said he wrote on everything: memos, wall boards. It's the economy. That was his message. And no matter what Clinton was doing, and it got so bad that he added the word stupid at the end, it's the economy, stupid, because that's what his message was. So guess what? It's risk, everybody. I've heard it from, I've spent most of my career in your jobs. I've heard it from regulators around the world, uh, North America, Asia, Europe. I've heard it from CEOs who answer board questions that really have nothing to do with risk by bringing up risk. And it's fundamental to everything we do. So when you think about risk culture, um, I, I think the challenge you have is this. Um, everybody in this room, 
is, um, is trying to do the right thing. You're all honest, hardworking, you want to comply with your values, you want to treat people right, and you want to go forward. And that's usually most companies, you know, board of directors, CEOs, senior officers, they all have a view that, listen, we're going to manage our business, we know our risk, we know where our lines are. The challenge, though, for some of you who work for large companies, and even for those of you who work for branches that may be, you know, 10 miles away, 10 kilometers away, it's how does that culture that's to that is toned from the top get driven down to the branch level? Does that get driven down to the individual salesperson, the individual rep, the individual branch manager? And, you know, we talk about the TD situation, and, you know, I'm not here to throw stones. I was the Camlo at BMO. AML is really, really tough. If you get offered your AML job, say no, walk away. <laughs> um, but you know, TD's great. I mean, I, I know people that work there. My son worked there. They're really bright, smart people, and they're trying to do the right thing. There were branches, two of them, in Queens, New York, where that risk culture wasn't there. And that brought TD down to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars of fines. So it's not easy. Uh, I don't profess to have all of the answers or any of the answers. But what I'll do is come back to where I try to approach culture, whether or not it's the culture of risk or just the culture of the organization. You've got to come back to your values. If your CEO, your senior investment, your board, your managers aren't talking about your values every single day, in everything they write, you're not going to get there. If you want a risk appetite to hold, you've got to talk about risk appetite every single day. If you want a risk appetite to hold, you've got to provide a scenario where your employees, even in the branches, can have a voice, can raise something. And when they raise something, what's the, um, the, the Homeland Security, if you see something, say something, right? If you see something, say something. And you've got to protect that. And even if you say something and it doesn't turn out to be anything, celebrate that. In particular, when you do say something and there is something, celebrate the heck out of that. So my view is it comes back to values. And it's not something in the bad old days for those of us who used to go to an office. You know, it's not that laminated thing you stick on, they give you once a year and you stick it on your wall. It's what you do every single day. And your risk culture, and it's all about risk, you're all underpaid, you all should get a raise, it's all about risk. It's more important that that conversation starts from the board, goes to the CEO, goes to the senior levels, and goes all the way down to the branch level. Every leader should be talking about culture, a risk culture, and you need to put into place mechanisms and frameworks within your organizations that support that. Just saying we have a risk culture isn't gonna help it. If somebody in a branch had said, I don't know about these bags of money coming in. You know, well, I don't know about that transaction. You know, and I, I'm not throwing stones, my goodness gracious. Um, it's a tough world out there. But if that was there in a protected way, maybe. Again, no answers, just problems. Thank you, Blair. That was, that was very helpful, insightful. Jordan, it's a little hard act to follow after, yeah, after say, these. Can I get the next question? Or? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll try to pick up without overlapping. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation for this event. I was very uh, intrigued with having a risk conference above a liquor store, so kudos to you. Um, so we talk a lot about um, you know, risk culture, and the way I look at it is it, people sometimes perceive that the regulator is saying, don't take any risk, and they come in and they're going to sort of armchair quarterback and criticize. And that isn't the way, at least we approach it at FISRA. Um, I would describe it as a risk-informed culture. So what, is that, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at um, three of the most existential events in the last 15 years, right, um, the global financial crisis, which probably needs no explanation. In part, it gave rise to this um, wonderful GRI. Um, secondly, a global pandemic. And the third, most recently, as we learned this morning, um, AI. These are not emerging risks. The implications, though, um, and how these events and how these developments are going to impact your institution and your system, that's where um, you know, there's more challenge for, for organizations. And I think what we want to see is um, proper process of decision making. 
so that financial institutions or financial services business um, are making decisions that are informed by the risks, the risk to capital, the risk to liquidity, so that they're taking bets. Sometimes you're going to lose on those bets, and that's fine, as long as it's within your risk appetite. The biggest problem is when organizations follow a certain course and they don't understand the implications of that course. You're not going to always get it correct, obviously, but you should at least turn your mind to um, what, are, what is the impact of this? Have we got the proper lens on this? Do we have the right people in the room to give us perspectives on whether this is the right decision for this organization? And what makes financial services so challenging and what makes it so complex is you're not just talking about a business making a bad decision and having consequences, right? We regulate collectively, we regulate deposit taking institutions. There has to be the confidence that people are gonna get their money when they want it. We regulate pensions. There has to be the confidence that planned administrators can pay out that benefit when people retire. Um, we regulate um, insurance companies, as we've seen graphically this year with the developments in uh, natural catastrophes. Policyholders want an expectation they're going to get their claims paid out in a timely way. That's absolutely integral. And to a lesser extent, not lesser extent, but I mean, they're not financial institutions, but mortgage administrators and mortgage brokers. Um, are integral to um, the ability for people to finance um, homes. And when those businesses fail, it's not just that they fail because of bad risk management, it creates a overall impact on the system and people lose confidence in the system. And if you want um, as graphic an example of this, which was also informed by a lot, lack of risk culture, look at Silicon Valley Bank. Think of that one institution and the domino impact that that failure had on the banking system. And it wasn't just the United States, it was in Canada too. And so risk, um, risk awareness is about making informed decisions. And I agree you know, with my panelists, it has to be embedded in the culture. What I would tell you, which is a little bit different, is I think about this not only in terms of culture, I think it in terms of the character of the organization. So what do I mean by that? Um, Blair touched on this. One of the great examples of this was what happened, for those of you who um, remember, with the Tylenol poison square that happened to J&J &J in the 1980s. Well, one of the things that people didn't realize is that the decisions they made in those first 24 to 48 hours were absolutely critical. And they were guided by the ethos of the company that was formed you know, at its beginning, which is do no harm to patients, doctors, or nurses. That informed their decision making. It, it wasn't um, unlike what happened more locally with uh, Maple Leaf Foods when they had the listeriosis. People made a decision which some questioned at the time as being maybe a bad business decision in terms of the financial implications to the business. But in the long term, they followed those values to demonstrate the character and it was the right decision in hindsight. Other companies we've seen, a great, another example of this on the other um, end of the spectrum is Volkswagen. Right? I've worked for a German um, financial institution. Um, if there's any cultural um, focus on compliance, it's within, it's within German companies. How a company like Volkswagen engaged in an emission scandal where various levels within the organization thought that was okay. And if you probably asked them, they probably said we have a very good culture. But it's the character of the firm and from a regulator's point of view, like you know, we all see you know, bad things. That's part of what regulators do. What is most telling to me isn't finding things that are problematic. It's when firms start to rationalize what they've done. And that's when, you know, sort of the bat radar goes off and your, your spidey sense and you're thinking, how did they rationalize this, right? Every complicated financial business is going to have compliance problems. I defy any business that isn't that to say that they don't. You absolutely do. You have human error. You have systems error. You have a whole bunch of things. That is going to happen. But how you respond to it and how you deal with it, not just in terms of your customers, but also with your regulators in terms of being transparent, being um, owning up to things and showing that you're going to rectify them. That's what regulators want to hear. They don't want to sanction. You know, when a file gets to the enforcement side, that's a failure. That's a failure not just of the institution. It's a failure of the regulator. How did this institution get to the point where it was so uninformed on the risks that we're taking? So I think, um, and I, I do agree without um, co covering again what, what my panelists have said, this is the existential issue of our time. You know, we will see more financial crisis. We will see the next event, whether it's, you know, whether it's another pandemic, whatever it is, 
It's the resiliency of the institutions to actually turn their mind to the implications and to start having preparedness that is critical for their ultimate survival because they have to adapt, right? This is Darwinism, financial services Darwinism. It's not about who has the biggest balance sheet. We saw that through the global financial crisis. It's the ability to adapt to those risks as they emerge and being able to actually continue to run your business and ultimately thrive. Thanks very much for those great insights. So I'm going to maybe slightly switch gears, and Jordan, will leave the microphone with you for a minute. Um, from the financial institution sector, the elephant in the room that gets referenced a lot is the, the degree of regulation going on and whether it is increasing and whether we are moving away from being a, a principle-based regulatory environment to a prescription-based one and whether in the midst of more <clears throat> guidelines coming our way from different jurisdictions, the concept of proportionality is remaining intact. So how would you respond to those questions? Pro proportionality, uh, are we still principle-based, and how are we approaching, how are you approaching as regulators to the new type of guidelines that are being published uh, with those concepts in mind? So it's a very topical question. It's a very good question. Um, the common chord that I hear always is the burden. Um, and when I hear it, I'm always intrigued by it because in financial services, there's no question that um, regulation has an impact, your compliance, your risk, your audit, it has an impact, right? If there's a cost to it, there's an FTE cost, um, you are in the business ultimately of taking risk and making money and um, that's part of why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I think what I sometimes get a little bit troubled with is the regulation isn't really for regulation's sake. It's actually to, it's to improve the sustainability and the resilience of the business of the system. And so as a regulator, you have a micro view of the entire system. Um, when we started FISRA, and this goes back um, to the expert panel that was formed in 2000, and, I think it was 2014, 2015, when they looked at other regulatory systems around the world, it wasn't just in Canada, and they made a very conscious, deliberate decision to be principles-based. And, you know, I, I, I'm in the company of, you know, two other excellent regulators. I think one thing that we have done exceptionally well at FISRA is that we've really tried to um, live this in our values and our approach every day to being more principles-based. So what does that mean? True principles-based is actually intended to reduce the burden. And what do I mean by that? If you treat there's, there's three principal um, tools that you use as a principles-based regulator. The first is guidance. Guidance is not intended to be prescriptive. If you take guidance and you turn it into a list of prescriptive requirements, then you're, um, you're, you're actually taking the wrong approach. Um, guidance is really, I think of it as, there's two aspects that we use it for. Our approach to supervision, so we're sort of you're getting our inner thoughts of how we're going to approach when we come in and, and look at your, your business, how we're going to supervise you, what we're going to be thinking about. And that allows you, that's the inside base, baseball that allows you to understand these are the areas that the regulator is going to have questions or going to have concerns about. Interpretation, which is part of our guidance framework, is how we're interpreting that statutory scheme. And, you know, um, Blair's a lawyer, so he'll appreciate this. Actuaries tend to be more, actuaries tend to be more binary. Retired lawyers. Retired. Um, there's multiple interpretations to any statutory provision. If there wasn't, we wouldn't have the Court of Appeal, right? That sometimes flips and flops. Lawyers can look at something and come to different, reasonable people can disagree and come to different interpretations. What we're trying to do is come to an interpretation that is at a point in time that we think reflects, in our case, our statutory objects. Those objects are guiding principles in our act that we look at them as an overlay to our sector statutes. So things like protecting the rights and interests of consumers, um, protecting plan members, beneficiaries, deterring fraud, facilitating innovation, right? These are things that we think about every day. And so the guidance is meant to provide an indication to the regulated business of how we're thinking about things. The benefit of being principles-based is that how they, how they design their processes is really within their, within their purview, right? Depending upon their size, skill, complexity, they can actually do whatever they want within a realm of reasonableness, provided they're getting the right outcomes. And what does that mean? You should understand, if we're saying, and I'll give you a, a, current, a current example, we had a, um, an issue in the auto insurance sector with the um, mandatory requirement to provide quoting. Insurers in Ontario have to quote in accordance with their filed rules and their rates. 
Um, there was all different ways that you could avoid that through using aggregators and filters or slowing quotes to the point where the consumer would get frustrated and go to another company. We were very clear in our guidance saying the outcome we're trying to achieve is consumers should get timely quotes that are reflective of your rules and your rates. And if you need to change your rules because you don't want to write a certain type of vehicle or a certain class of driver, you do it in a transparent way. But it's the outcome. Measure how quickly those quotes are being provided to your consumer so they actually can make a buying decision. How they did it, we weren't going to tell them how to do it. We said use your risk functions, use your audit functions to make sure that you're validating those outcomes. So how they want to design their processes is within their purview. Get the outcomes. The other tool that we use to reduce the burden is things like a thematic review. We just did one on home insurance property claims, which ends up being very topical given what's happened with natural catastrophes. When you publish a thematic review as a regulator, you're letting the, everyone know this is what we're thinking about. We've identified what may or may not be a problem. Um, before we start dealing with supervision and enforcement, we want you to look at this. Is this a problem in your business? Right? Do you, some of the, uh, some of the things you, we've identified in that thematic review, are they relevant to your operations? The third thing that we use that honestly, um, you know, if I was on the other side, which I was for most of my career, it's called a Dear CO letter. A Dear CO letter is really, hey, um, C-suite, we think there's a problem here. We've seen this either through complaints or through whistleblowing. We want you to come back to us and give us your perspective. Is it a problem within your business? The first Dear CO letter we wrote to the 12 largest insurers in Ontario, only one insurer bothered to respond. And so the burden doesn't have to be onerous if you manage it and you understand how the regulator is communicating and the signals so you can adjust and um, be able to run your business more autonomously. Thank you, Jordan. Blair and Jack, then I'll turn it to you for the same question. We can go in any order, but I'm sure you have insights to add. Want to go first? Yeah, so um, I have had the great honor to speak for the last four years at PASIC's annual risk officers forum, and I know Alistair's in the room. I get this question every single year about the burden of you know, regulatory oversight and guidelines and this and that, and I give the same answer every year. And that's when I was on the other side of the table, and I was for most of my career, I just joined OSFI in 2020. When I was an executive, we talked about culture risk. And we talked about technology risk. And we talked about climate risk. And we talked about third party risk. And we talked about operational risk. And there's not a guideline that we've issued, principle based guidelines that talk about outcomes, um, like East Jordan said, that we weren't talking about. That wasn't on our agendas for executive meetings and executive retreats and annual meetings of all the chief risk officers from around the world. So I've said it, I mean, you've heard me over and over again, Alistair. <laughs> I love you. I don't, I don't by the burden, um, every insurer and every insurance industry association doesn't have to respond to everything. You can find different ways through your organizations to coordinate your responses if, if you want to when the guidelines are open for consultation. Um, you know, and I can use the third party risk management because you mentioned it as an example, and we didn't even speak about that in advance. But there's, in the beginning of our guideline, the B10, it, you know, it talks about proportionality in two ways, uh, that the institutions would look at the criticality of a specific third party, and then they would look, consider their own size and complexity, systemic impact of the institution. So it's kind of like a two-way test. And if I think there's six outcomes in our third party risk management guideline, that institutions have clear governance and accountability structures, that they can identify and assess the risks of third parties, that they can manage and mitigate these risks, that they monitor and assess third party performance, that their third party risk management program allows them to manage a range of third party relationships, and that technology and cyber operations are carried out by third parties that are transparent, reliable, secure. Right? That doesn't sound burdensome to me. If I was an insurance exec or a bank exec, that just sounds reasonable and prudent. So I stay where I have for four years. I don't, I don't quite buy it. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> um, three quick points. Um, first point is this is hard, right? So everyone says we love principal regulation. So we all issue principal regulation. All of you go back to your offices with your experts, your lawyers, your accountants, the business people, and you say, what does the regulator mean by that? How are we going to be judged on that? So we issue guidance, right? Here's what we're thinking. Do you mean you're going to be judged on this guidance? 
No, no, it's guidance. So how do you find that middle ground? I, I agree 100%. It is in the circumstances. So this cycle has been happening for a long time, right? Even on prescriptive uh, regulation, there, there are, there's case law, there's fights in front of commissions and about what it really means. So, you know, there's no easy answer here, right? I, I think everyone is in love with principles-based regulation. That sounds great. That sounds wonderful. How you apply it and your risk appetite in terms of applying it, um, BCFSA issues guidance, oh, sorry, issues, uh, you know, um, uh, issues of issues based um, policy. And then we issue guidance in support of that. You see that guidance. What risk are you going to take if you think you're going to not comply with our guidance? It's really hard. So good luck with that. The uh, <laughs> second thing is proportionality. Um, BCFSA uh, regulates financial service sector in British Columbia, so very similar to FISRA, um, but we also have real estate licensees and mortgage brokers. Uh, uh, we don't have auto insurance, thank goodness. Um, and you know, in the credit union space, um, we have a credit union that's $29 billion, and we also have credit unions that are $50 million. So, you know, we hear a lot about proportionality. And what I'd say to all of you in proportionality is proportionality doesn't mean you don't get to deal with the underlying issue. It just means you get to deal with the underlying issue in a different way. It all comes back to risk, okay? It all comes back to risk. And the third thing I would say is something I learned in my career when I was opposite the OCC is how you approach the regulator with, um, on, on whether or not it's principle-based, rules-based regulation. Try to understand what the regulator is looking at. If your answer to the regulator is, we're doing it because you told us to, it doesn't go very well. Because that doesn't, that doesn't tell us, and it certainly didn't tell the OCC in the US when I told them that, that I actually understood what they were dealing with. So whether or not it's principles, whether or not it's rules, go to the underlying risk. What are we worried about? And show us that you, as compliant, valued-based, good corporate citizens are trying to address that issue. That will go a long way. Thank you. And I, we're getting kind of close to the time where I want to open up for questions. I'm sure there are some, we're going to get some great questions. There's one last question that I want to maybe go around and get your input. Blair, I want to start with you. We'll leave the microphone with you for now. So um, talking about the world we live in now and looking at ahead maybe three to five years from now, what do you think we need to get right today so that we don't have a big issue three to five years from now? That w this moment is an important moment to get it right. And what risk domain are you especially thinking about? Yeah, I'm question? worried about the next three to four weeks, yeah. <laughs> three to four months, three to four years. Yeah. But I, I would say, the pace of change, and you know, I think uh, mentioned Jeremy mentioned like one in a hundred events. I'm tired of them. One in a hundred year events happening during my career. I'm tired of that. The pace of change is so incredibly fast. The interconnections are so many are so fast. When I was in school and they talked about the depression and they talked about bank failures, there were pictures in our school books with men standing outside of the bank waiting to get in to see if they can get their money. That didn't happen in Silicon Valley Bank. It's a bunch of people on their phones. AI that you heard about today, where is AI going to come out? Are you of the, it's going to help mankind? Or are you of more of the iRobot, it's going to destroy mankind? So I think the, the risk that I see is the pace of change is happening so quickly and we as organizations, whether or not they're regulators, whether or not they're um, registrants, how are we having the conversations to deal with whatever it is? Now, I could predict it's AI, I could predict it's climate, I could predict it's all of those things. But I think the infrastructure, the, the conversations, the dialogues is something I would want to make sure that all of us are talking about. Again, let's come back to first principles. We don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. Let's make sure we're talking to get to the right answers. Because fundamentally, we both want the same thing. We want a financial services sector that is 
confident. It provides confidence to people. That's the mission of BCFSA. You don't want to have a financial service sector, you know, putting your money in a bank, you're going to get it back, put your money in a credit union, invest in insurance, are you going to actually protect that risk? You have to have confidence. And I think we all owe that. And having a market that doesn't have confidence is not where we want to be. Thank you. Jackie. So I'm going to be contrarian again. I think, think uh, since I first graduated uh, high school and university, it's been a piece of change that's been like none other. You know, I first programmed on punched cards. I, you know, I think of the size of my laptops, my computers, desktop laptops, and phones. I used to carry around this giant thing with my first cell phone. So I, I mean, it seems like I'm always there's always change. So that doesn't c concern me. You know, my kids are using AI, one's in mechanical engineering, he's using it to debug his code, the other's summarizing legal cases with it for law school. You know, it's just, it, it's table stakes around the Thanksgiving table last year. My kids are early 20s, all the kids from Waterloo and McGill and U of T all talking about how they're using it. So, um, where do I see weakness? I see weakness, OSFI developed a new supervisory framework that it rolled out in April. It was the first time in 25 years we really introduced revolutionary change in our supervisory methodology. And we have four pillars, business risk, financial resilience, operational resilience, and risk governance. And operational resilience, our new methodology is based on your, your overall score can't be better than your weakest link. And while we're not giving averages of where everyone is, um, the weakest link is operational resilience. And operational resilience has three aspects. It's got cyber risk, technology risk, and operational risk. And so I'm concerned about that. And you know, if you ask, what do I want to see as the federal regulator? I'm going to speak for my prepared remarks on this. How do we get better prepared? I want to see open and meaningful dialogue about these risks in particular among senior management and board. And I know in the room we have senior management and we have board <laughs> members. I want to see robust plans, business continuity and disaster recovery plans, and for the largest, most systemically important institutions, banks or insurers, robust recovery and resolution plans. I want to see comprehensive stress testing beyond an FCT for the insurers, the financial condition testing that an actuary does. I want to see the stress testing of non-financial risks, risks that aren't in the CIA's actuarial's ed note. Um, I want to see appropriate capital and liquidity planning that considers those non-financial risk stress testing. A lot of this should be incorporated in, what, in what's called an ICAP for the bank, the Individual Capital Adequacy Assessment Process, or an ORSA, Own Risk Solvency Assessment for an insurer. None of this is really new. What's possibly new is also in the midst of all of this is you need to consider geopolitical and you need to consider climate as well, which in our new scorecard is actually, we call it a transverse risk because climate can impact business risk, it can impact financial resilience, it can impact operational resilience, and you gotta have risk governance about it. And that's why we place it in our scorecard as transverse. Thanks for that, Jackie. I think you covered a lot of good ground there with the new framework as well, which I'm sure there are interested parties in the room. Jordan, we'll bring it maybe as last person to speak for the question, and then I'll open it up for those are, those are hard responses to uh, add to, but I'll, I'll make one observation, which is I remember um, right after the, well, right on the heels of the financial crisis, I became, a, I assumed, the chief risk officer responsibility, and I went to Dusseldorf for a worldwide risk conference. And there was a uh, speaker, keynote speaker, who had a PhD in finance at a German university. And he was a tenured professor, which is as close you get to God, I guess. Um, and he took out, and he, and he talked, you know, he got up and he talked about, you know, um, the, in, the, the fallibility of models. And he stopped and he said, if you want to do effective risk management, go and hire as many people that have history degrees. And his point was, this is, none of this is new. Right? There's been financial crises before. There's been geopolitical pressures before. Right? Um, it's, as Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again. However, the speed at which things happen to Blair's point is the greatest problem right now. Right? You don't have the benefit of um, time often, which means that resiliency, that break the glass plan is so integral to actually the sustainability and the viability of a financial, a financial services business. And so the same type of problems still exist, but it's the speed with which they can have an impact that are, you know, it's a global economy. 
technology facilitates. One of the biggest challenges we had during COVID was we had a credit union, a billion dollar credit union under administration. And you know, I would go to bed every night you know, saying a prayer that there was not a run on this institution. And we were saved largely because um, they didn't have technology that allowed instant transfers like Silicon Valley. But that could have ended very badly, um, not just for that credit union and its depositors, but for the entire system. And so sometimes speed is on your side and sometimes it works against you. But that, to me, that is the importance of having um, good risk management. You don't have to think, you just act. Thank you very much. A lot of good insights and wonderful comments uh, today. So I'm going to open the floor for questions now. I'm sure you have some questions, comments. Uh, and so please put up your hand and we'll bring a microphone uh, to you. If you don't have questions, I have more questions, don't worry. But I really would like to give the microphone to the room first. I count on Alistair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, loved all of it. Uh, and I'm going to ask a question that has nothing to do with my day job uh, in risk. Uh, when you think about system health as regulators, in Canada there's this growing public discussion around the structure of many of our industries, oligopolistic, uh, low in competition, our banking sector, our life insurance sector, uh, our telecom sector, our grocery sector. There's so that, uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting public policy outcomes that could come from that in the next while. Uh, as you think about system health as regulators, obviously the first instinct is to maintain confidence by ensuring no failure. Uh, but Canada seems to be paying quite a high price for prudence. Uh, and one of the consequences of that is uh, con consolidation uh, and perhaps less competition and innovation. So I'd be very interested in thinking, when you think about systemic health as regulators, are you thinking holistically or are you really, by your mandates, uh, thinking primarily prudentially? So I'll start, because we are a prudential regulator. We don't have any market conduct uh, responsibilities. We now have integrity and security um, because of parliament changes a year and a half ago, uh, including national security. Um, you know, I look at it, and I'm a bit of a glass half full kind of person, and I think we have 147 PNC insurers. You know, yes, one of them is an inter internationally active insurance group with a big percentage of the market share, but there are 146 others that find a niche and a place to play. And we have 90 something life insurers, even if we have three internationally active insurers here that are among the largest in the world. So there's still niches and places to play. Um, we have six systemically important banks, uh, but we also have close to 90 other small and medium-sized banks that include category three banks and foreign bank branches and a lot, and they become innovative in the products and their distribution and how they get their products and interact with their customers. So, you know, I see every day innovation and novel approaches. Um, we don't say we won't accept a failure. We, in our risk appetite statement, and, and um, Superintendent Rutledge is, you know, has brought wonderful change and transformation to OSPI. We have a risk appetite statement on our website. We don't want a surprise. We don't want a disorderly failure. But we can't, we don't have enough resources to I ensure that there are, you know, what we've been fortunate, we've been wise, I think we've been successful but we're not promising no failures. In BCFSA is subject to, or part named in 10 statutes, and we have eight segments where we can actually charge fees to an industry, credit unions, trust companies. And, you know, when we, when we started our journey at BCFSA, I wanted to focus on the sector. And, you know, I told you we had FIs, we have uh, pensions, we have, uh, mortgage brokers, real estate. When you do that, depending on the math, it's probably between 20 and 30% of the GDP of the whole province. So um, we have prudential, but we also have market conduct. So we are special in BC. And we have both of those scenarios. The conversation I've had with the segments, with the leaders, has all been about you're part of a larger sector which is interconnected. So this can happen in BC. If you decide to buy a home, you might actually get a real estate licensee. 
DCFSA licensed that person. You find that house and you may make a down payment. Well, if that down payment is coming through a credit union, we regulate the credit union. You might then go search for um, a mortgage broker, we regulate the mortgage broker. You then might have insurance uh, that you buy for your house, we regulate that from a market conduct perspective. The deal closes and something doesn't smell right. We can connect all the dots. So that's the segment, the sector view that we've talked about. Now, we had our first sector segment, you know, OSC Speaks, uh, FISRA has their insight process, OSFI talks a lot. So we had our first sector wide uh, two years ago in June, and we talked at the sector level. And we had such great comments, but every other comment was, can you just talk about my segment next time? <laughs> so we're on a journey, and you are interconnected. And so we are trying to um, connect the dots, um, look at it from an overall sector perspective. Climate affects all of those entities. So we are very focused on climate. Market conduct, it's all about confidence. And when you're talking about um, um, a sector that is that big and that important, you know, uh, some of life's most important decisions, if you're an individual buying a home, insurance, retiring, all of those scenarios, um, and they're such interconnected, um, that's our job and that's our journey. So it, it's a great question. Um, we, are, we are elevating it and talking about it. Our authority, though, comes from 10 different statutes and 10 different segments, or sorry, eight different segments. Great. So it, it, I think it's a fantastic question, and it's funny, I'm looking at Jordan Brennan because we just had this conversation um, with the former finance minister right before lunch. Um, <laughs> like literally this very question came up and I just a couple observations. I mean, it is a, obviously a large P policy question that the regulators aren't going to drive. It's going to be the people in Queens Park or Victoria or Ottawa. But I think it raises some really important issues. We look at the life sector. We have three global players in Canada, right? That are three of the largest. Um, they've done well abroad. Um, there are companies that, um, you know, that haven't done as well when they go abroad. Um, we are confined in Canada by both geography and the density, concentrated density of the population, which makes it a very difficult market to scale. I think that um, regulators need to be thinking about this in terms of um, having greater harmonization. So for businesses that need to operate across Canada that need scale, um, we should be doing, I think, what the securities regulators have done, which is to have a system that allows it more seamless because we have constitutional challenges. And in fact, um, one of the things I'm most personally proud of that I was able to do the last five years with Larry Ritchie and Mary Condon, we got Osgood to do a course now, a certificate course that is by invitation only just for financial services regulators. We ran the first cohort in January, February last year, got everybody around the table, AMF, BCFSA, OSC, um, and had a really good conversation about these issues right about the larger sustainability of the marketplace and you know we're looking at it within our within our within our within our each of our neighborhoods but our neighborhoods are part of a larger community that we have to be looking at the overall uh, health but i think it's i don't have an answer to your question but i think it's it is i see it as the the existential question of our time right now thank you for that um i think we have a question there I knew Alistair would have the first question, so I want to give him a chance first. <laughs> um, you talked about the, uh, uh, what people refer to as a regulatory burden. Um, and frankly, almost everybody that one talks to in the insurance sector is concerned. There's a real regulatory burden. Uh, and this question is really directed at Jackie. Uh, Jackie, you seem to think that there, there isn't one. Uh, why is it that virtually everybody in the insurance sector finds there is a regulatory burden. And why do you think all of those people have that view? So I think in part is, and, and we were part of this together at time, we had just come through IFRS 17. And IFRS 17 was so many years in the making before it even had the number 17 attached to it. There were years we were involved in it when the US was at the table. So we have just done, you know, gone through the biggest accounting change uh, you know, uh, it, certainly in my whole career, but decades and decades, and we're exhausted from that. 
And I think certainly in the PNC sector, it hasn't stopped with the natural catastrophes. You know, whether it was Fort McMurray, whether it was, you know, Ontario floods and Alberta floods, where all the different kind of things, it, it just never seems to stop. And um, it, it, so I think that's part, I mean, I don't think we can underestimate the impact of IFRS 17. And, um, you know, but I just, so, Dave, what is it about our culturist guideline that now we're not going to issue in that way? We'll do a regulatory notice, or the operational risk, or the third-party risk management, or the technology in cyber? Like, where would you not have? I mean, where are those not issues that executives sh and boards should be thinking about? Like, it it affects everything. So, I, you know, like I, I I don't see something that we're doing that's different than what's coming out of Basel or coming out of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Like we're right in, in, in step, sometimes a little behind <clears throat> these other organizations. Um, we, you know, we look at the quarterly risk decks and you know, I'm able to put, I can, you know, all of our institutions, I can you know, put an Excel spreadsheet, here are the risks that they're rating, you know, green, yellow, red, that they're following, that they're reporting on, and I can link it to a, a box in our new scorecard, and I can link it to a guideline or something on our risk registry. There's not something else that's out, out there. So, you know, I, I don't, when I was at RSA, when I was appointed actuary to Allstate, when I was in these different roles, when I was on the other side of the table, the, these were things that were important to me. So. But I hear you. I hear it at IBC when I go for my annual meeting with Peter. You know, I, we just got back a, a number of my colleagues from the NIC in Vancouver. It's all they heard. You know, we heard it in our survey feedback from the industry this year. You know, so, but I don't know. I don't understand the answer, really. Perhaps the common thread between the questions is really the, the pace of change is happening so fast that it requires more rigorous frequency of uh, issuance of things. But these are, these are documents that have been coming for years and years that the implementation dates has been staggered. You know, some of B13 or B10 will be effective you know, sooner and then others over time and the climate regulatory return will be you know, up for SIBs and the IAIGs before it'll be for the others. And if you saw the climate regulatory returns that they're asking for south of the border, you'd be happy with the climate regulatory returns <laughs> we're asking for. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Jackie. I think we have another question here from Reza. Hi, uh, great session. And as someone who has dealt with uh, other global regulators, I think in Canada we are doing a decent job and much better job. Uh, so thanks for doing what you're doing. But I guess all of you have in your websites and others talked about top risk uh, that uh, institutions uh, or you are concerned about. But in your own words, I would be very interested to see what each of you, that one risk in 2025 that you think really is of concern to the industry or things that we should be thinking about. What, what would you, each of you, talk about? You only have one word. You have to go with one word. I'm joking. Please go ahead. Yeah. If you say it fast, it's going to, so. <laughs> climate, cyber, AI. I mean, climate is um, impacting all of us. It impacts our lives. It impacts, um, you know, your profitability, your, your risk profiles. Um, BC is, is special in that um, we've ticked the box on all of them. Uh, earthquake risk, flood, fire. Um, how the industry responds, the disclosures, um, all of that, and how we deal with a planet that whether or not climate yes or no, the facts are, you know, we're going to have the biggest uh, fire burn ever. Now, this year it, in BC, it wasn't so much concentrated in urban areas, so that was good, but we still had hectares and hectares burn. So what's that mean? How's that work? Cyber, um, it, you know, when I, when I first started getting into the cyber business, it was like, you've been breached, you're gonna get sued by your shareholders and this. We've evolved, everybody is getting breached. It's a matter of when you get breached. And now we've evolved into, okay, how do you handle it? How do you communicate? How do you, sh you share that with the public markets if you're publicly traded? How do you share that with your customers? How do you share that with your regulators? 
And I think AI, um, you know, I think, you know, just on the simple black box, what's the information going into the black box that's helping you make that decision? Is it biased? Is it wrong? Like, where's the sources? Um, how are you? So as a supplement, uh, right now, I think it's great. You know, you can write papers, you can write speeches, you can write summations. But fundamentally, there's so much that goes on behind that black box that I would be like, like all of you. Okay, let's work our way through this because if you're going to make decisions that are going to impact people's lives, you better know what the facts are that are driving that decision. I said them all quickly. <laughs> Jordan, one big what risk. would you like to add? Yeah. I think that was more than one. Yeah, no, it was one big risk. So I, <laughs> it's principle-based risk. Exactly. One big risk. You know, it's interesting. I, um, I sort of defy, and I'd be interested if anybody in February 2020 had identified as their top risk a global pandemic, and the answer would be no. So as soon as I throw a dart at the board, I'm going to miss it. Right. Um, I would say if I were to identify one um, thread. Um, you know, that you put the needle through for our sectors. It would be um, macroeconomic development, the interest rates. We're now, you know, we saw an interest rate adjustment that was the largest in 15 years. There's a whole generation of people that have never seen a double digit mortgage rate. Um, that, you know, it, it affects almost every aspect of financial services, right? It affects pensions plans. We heard this morning their discount rate, their investment return. It affects insurance companies, life, PNC. It affects deposit taking institutions and it affects mortgage brokers and administrators. And I think that that microeconomic uh, development and the uncertainty that the globe, that's been created because of the global economy is a huge, is a big risk that people should be paying a lot of attention to. And the other I would say to Alistair's point is I think the lack of innovation, right? I think that, um, you know, we haven't had a great history in this country of producing world-class businesses right? Um, there's been real challenges. And I think that, you know, sometimes we're too small a market globally to matter. We're an important market for a lot of companies. But, you know, um, outside of banking, we're largely serviced by foreign, you know, there's a lot of foreign capital, which is fine. But um, I think we have to start developing our own uh, best in class, uh, world class businesses. And I think that, you know, I always was amazed. I've worked for a lot of US companies. We have relative to the United States, we have a pretty um, it's, it's a much easier system in terms of financial services regulation, right? It's less rule-based. It, there's a lot more flexibility. You know, you have better relationships with your regulators. You can sit across the table and solution with them. And we should be driving more innovation than we do. And I don't see it. And it troubles me because as the regulator, innovation doesn't mean you're ignoring the rules. Innovation means you're looking at how to do your business smarter to deliver better consumer benefit. And sometimes that means the rules don't apply. So we do forbearance or we do a no action letter, but you know, the systems, the, the regulatory frameworks are set in stone. They, it takes a long time to get them changed. So the regulators, what we do have as a regulator is discretion. You know, some people call them sandboxes, but ultimately it's, it's regulatory discretion. You know, does application of the framework in a given circumstance, does it get to the right outcome? And if it doesn't, then as the regulator, we should be questioning it. But we should be focused on innovation, I think, to be competitive. Jack, then we'll give the last word to you. Yeah. So I've already talked about operational resilience, so I won't mention it again. In a few hours at sunset, I'll begin um, observing Rosh Hashanah. And in reading the newspaper yesterday, the New York Times, I read the word nuclear more times than I had ever had since I was a little kid and watched something that was on TV, you know, some doomsday something. It's a little disturbing, the whole geopolitical situation in many areas of the world. But what came to mind most, and maybe it'll be the last research paper I do before I retire, is I started the morning um, early with an International Association of Insurance Supervisor call on natural catastrophes. And I'm leading a global effort to look at a, a special research report on the financial impact, particularly on stability, on natural catastrophe protection gaps. So um, I had colleagues from develop worlds and developing markets, and we're going to figure out what the scope is. The report will come out next December, and I'm really looking forward to it. Hope that Canada earthquake, I can get that to be one of the you know five or six examples that we look at, even if it'll have to be all model-based, and I'll call you, Alistair. But natural catastrophes, climate and non-climate, uh, concern me greatly. 
Thank you. And we're at time now. I want to thank the panelists for joining us today. We heard some really rich insights and good questions. Thank you for your time. So please go to this event app and uh, go to this session, the name you see there, and fill out a survey. It's super short. We're going to take a 20-minute break, and we will meet you at the main room where you were this morning. And our next speaker is uh, Peter Rutledge. So uh, see you all there at 2.40. We are on break till then. Thank you. Thank you.